Bhopal Ram is full. The best But, outing uh, we used to have in monsoon in Bhopal was uh, opening gates of Badbada. <laughs> oh, they have opened the last two years successfully. Yeah. Last year, sir, this year. Sir, just a disclaimer here. Uh, we are just uh, initiating a live on uh, YouTube as well. Okay, done. So chin up. <laughs> so what time we begin? We're already. Seven. I think uh, we can we can start the program. I think the participants will keep joining in. Uh, we can always start the program. So, do you want to shoot your disclaimer now, or I no, just do the formalities? No, I actually don't. I don't have a um, visual disclaimer. I have an audio okay. disclaimer. The okay. topic given to me was difficulties in CABG valve surgery and heart transplant for surgeons. Now, I deliberately omitted heart transplant. I have, when I was a registrar abroad, I had assisted in heart transplants. I have struggled and gotten a transplant uh, license for my hospital. but i have not been able to do one so i don't think that i am really you know qualified to speak about difficulties in heart transplant so that's my disclaimer the second disclaimer is i would have loved to talk about difficulties in pediatric cardiac surgery i do about 300 a year but i'm not sure how many nurses are involved in an actual pediatric cardiac surgical program so that is the reason why i have left that also out and just restricted my talk to a coronary bypass and valvular replacements uh, that's my disclaimer all right so i will just uh, begin with the introduction okay okay so very good afternoon to one and all i am dwani purohit and on behalf of meril endo surgery we welcome you all to the second day of this interactive forum of the operation theater nurses convention virtually we hope you all have taken back a lot of key notes from yesterday's session and we ensure you will make the most of your time today as well to introduce our meril uh, endo surgery's products and beliefs we have a very short video for you asmita can we have the video please Thank you. Um, 
with this i will just again once again reintroduce our faculty mentor and speaker dr vivek kanare to all of you dr vivek kanare is a consultant cardiac surgeon based out of bhopal and is currently heading a group private private practice there he completed his cardiac surgery training at cmc hospital in velour in his former years at a, as as a practicing surgeon dr kanare was associated with sgp jai lucknow and bmhrc in bhopal he brings to the team a wealth of surgical experience along with a zeal and desire to the, to serve the people wherever he goes we are glad to have dr kanare with us again he never fails to add energy and bring value to the program about the agenda today the topic that will be covered is difficulties in cabg and valve surgery for surgeons and perfusionists and role of otoneosis in its mitigation any questions that are there during the course of the discussion can be entered in the chat box of the meeting window and we will take them up towards the end participants audio will will be kept muted during the session now we can go ahead with the topic for today dr kanare over to you yes somebody would please start the slide show uh, running and then we'll be off on the thing i'll just do that one second yeah sure thank you yeah okay good afternoon everybody uh, there was a small feedback i got from scrolling the chat room yesterday and that was that some of you wanted to me to speak in hindi i i have been told that they have organized breakout rooms and i would be very happy to you know visit a breakout room and talk to you about all this in hindi as well if you want for the sake of people uh, across the country and there are quite a few of them i see one name which at least looks to me as being from south central kumar typical tamilian name so i think english we will stick to here i can periodically lapse into hindi but if you have issues then tell dwani to organize a breakout room wherein i can speak fluently at least in hindi and fluently in marathi can we have the next slide See, I dropped the heart transplant and did not add the pediatric cardiac surgery as I thought that maybe we would not be doing justice, because most programs in this country do coronary bypass and valve surgery. Let me tell you a small story about heart transplant. If you draw a line west, north of Mumbai, somewhere in Gujarat, all the way straight to the east, eighty percent of the transplants in this country take place south of that line. so you'll have a vibrant program in say karnataka andhra tamil nadu kerala uh, parts of maharashtra but not such a vibrant program north of that line and i unfortunately seem to practice in the north of that line we've been licensed for transplant for 3 years and uh, believe me it's been difficult convincing a recipient forget about the donor donor to head injury mein mil hi jayega so i have deliberately omitted and yes i think we can take that up some other day Next slide, please. So you see, everything has to be simplified. If you have difficulties, then you will run into difficulties. And how will you take care of these difficulties? So, just A B C D. Anticipation. आप तैयार रहें. Being ready is you are ready. C. Communication. Talk. Talk to your professionals. Talk to your surgeon. And D. Actually, do something to solve the difficulty. so a b c d is the way to contribute overcoming difficulties during the operation next slide please so the first operation we were supposed to discuss is a coronary artery bypass grafting now what is a coronary artery bypass graft coronary artery bypass grafting is basically harvesting conduits that is the grafts you are going to use and anastomosing the vessels i have deliberately not put in cannulation and decannulation here because a majority of coronary bypass work in our country is done off pump we do not do my own practice uh, one of my surgeons practically does 99% off pump i am not that enthusiastic my work is about 85 to 90% off pump so can we have the next slide please so what are the difficulties a surgeon may face when he is harvesting an internal mammary are you aware that cautery settings can be changed some surgeons like their cautery settings to drop i don't but my colleagues do they operate on a lower cautery settings now are you also aware if the surgeon is going to be skeletonizing if i am going to be skeletonizing my mammaries which i do when i'm using two mammaries 
my Kotli setting is going to go down. If I'm going to use a pedicle memory, so there you have. You have a difficulty in a surgeon. So if you, again, to go back to A, B, C, D, if you are aware, you have anticipated this skeletonized hoga because of communication, then you're ready. As soon as the surgeon starts harvesting the memory, you instruct the uh, floor nurse to drop the cartilage settings. Then the second thing is, are we using a different energy source? Quite a few surgeons, including myself, many times use a harmonic scalp. So are we using it? Is the harmonic in the room? Is the hook ready? Or is the surgeon going to use the blade from the harmonic scalpel? Those are things which, again, I'm referred back to ABC. You have to be ready and all the difficulties in using the harmonic will be gone. The harmonic hook is generally a longer blade. So the surgeon likes to handle it less. I mean, you know, what laws of physics tell us that a small movement in the thumb and finger would, in a long blade would translate to rapid movements there. So surgeons then change their movements for harvesting the IMA if they're using a, a harmonic scan. And see, I already asked you whether we're using pedicled or skeletonized uh, internal memory. Generally, I tend to skeletonize my memories if I'm doing a BEMA operation, because then I think that I would devascularize the sternum less. And as I pointed out, the difficulty there is that the nurse who scrubbed with me knows if I'm going to do a BEMA, then my cautery settings are down because I'm skeletonizing it. If I'm not going to do a BEMA, my cautery settings are normal as if on the skin. Is he going to use papaverin? Most of us do use papaverin. What is the protocol for using papaverin? You have to be ready so that when the memory is down, he suddenly doesn't start screaming, lao, lao, papaverin, lao. And you have to also be ready with papaverin dilute solution in case he bathes it in, and also papaverin so gauze if he's going to put it on top. The last and not the least is a nightmare for any surgeon. You accidentally injured the distal part of the IMA. Now what you would do? It's, if you have really enjoyed it in the bay distal part, I will take a 200 sized medium clip, clip the IMA, ask the anesthesiologist to give half a dose of heparin and proceed. But what happens if you injure it proximally and the surgeon is yelling and screaming? Some of these surgeons can then either switch to a right internal thoracic artery across the sternum to the LAD, which I don't recommend, or, you know, the entire pedicle can be taken down and the lima can be used as a free lima graph, which the patency is not as good as a pedicle, I mean, as a lima, but free lima graph can be used, but you have to be ready. More, more common are these small branches which get evulsed. And the surgeon suddenly, if there is a small branch evulsion, the surgeon may ask you for a 7-0 proline to fix that branch because you can't get a tape across. So, be ready, be prepared for that kind of an event happening. And that is how you solve that difficulty. Next slide, please. The next conduit, which is very commonly used is the great saphenous vein. So naturally, remember yesterday, I talked to you about a handshake. The nurse gets a handshake from a pre-op patient, pre-op nurse. So are there any pre-existing venous disease? Is there any skin disease? Is there a skin ulcer? Has the patient had a fracture or a trauma to one limb? Stay away from that limb. Use the other limb. How is uh, the surgeon going to harvest the uh, vein? Is he going to not touch it at all? In case there will be a little streak of fat or something left, or is he going to do a minimal touch? Is he going to lay open the entire leg? You have to be ready for all this. A mastoid retractor is a must if the surgeon is going to start from the thigh. Is he going to use bridge? If he's going to use small, small incisions, which we call bridge incisions, you may need more than one mastoid to appropriately expose it. If the surgeon is going to loop the saphenous vein and then tug on it gently, you may need a silastic loop ready. You may need a cotton, umbilical cotton tape ready, or you may need a number two silk ready, depending on the surgeon's preference. Many people, including myself, we've used endoscopic uh, venous harvest. We earlier used to use a system uh, pioneered by Guidant, which required carbon dioxide insufficiency and an uh, endoscopic tower. You saw in the front and you worked blindly like a lap coli. 
So are we going to use an endoscopic? These days, uh, stores has come out with a system where you do not need to insufflate carbon dioxide. So make sure that if this system is going to be used, which some surgeons who insist on minimally invasive, because mind you, leg wounds cause me more trouble than sternal wounds after coronary bypass. So make sure that you are adequately A, trained, and B, you know what is going on. Then uh, after the vein is out, there are different protocols and you have to be ready for it. Many surgeons will not divide the vein till total heparinization of the patient has taken place. And then they will use some heparinized blood saline to flush the vein and check for the branches. Be sure that many surgeons are paranoid about not distending the vein too much because they think that damages the endothelium of the vein. And then there is a company which came and tried to sell me a solution called Soma Solution, which is a venous preservation solution. I have not used it, but if any of you are jai or journals may pare, so it seems to prolong the venous graft life. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So now, if you're dealing with the diabetic patient, 65% to 75, 70% of all coronary bypass patients are diabetic. Which hand is the patient handed? Don't presume that these are olden times because if the child started to write with his left hand, the parents uh, beat him up and forced him to write with the right hand. You will run into left-handed people. So which is the non-dominant hand? Generally, radials are harvested from the left. The handshake should show clearly that a Doppler and an Allen has been done. And now, how do you position the arm? If you lay it out like this and put an Lima retractor, the brachial plexus is going to be compressed. Is the surgeon wanting to harvest the IMA down, first put the retractor, then open the arm out and harvest the radial and put it back in? Or first harvest the radial, put the arm back in and then proceed with the Lima? These are things which you have to talk to people. Talk to the surgeon and be ready so that suddenly difficulties don't arise. Ki dono taraf kaise simultaneous harvest shuru kar diya, brachial plexus kharaab ho jaya, patient ka surgeon yelling and screaming. So the order has to be set. And everyone knows where we are going with this. Next slide, please. How are we going to approach? Are we going to do a classical open sternotomy? I have done all my operations through a classical open sternotomy. But there are more and more units which are trying to do minimally invasive procedures. You'd be surprised. You have to be ready for difficulties which may arise with minimally invasive procedures. The entire retractor takes a lot of setting up and has the arms are usually connected to the table before the minimally invasive program begins, even before it starts. The number of incisions from where is he going to put the um, sucking device, from where he's going to put the stabilizing device in case he's going to do minimally invasive are very important. Your conventional needle holders will not work in a minimally invasive coronary bypass. You will need longer instruments. You will need to be familiar with something called a signet clamp. Signet swan hota hai. You get familiar. I'm sure there are nurses here who worked in a minimally invasive program. The signet clamp goes, it gets screwed from the back. You don't have a crash, you have something in the back. And most surgeons, minimally invasive surgeons, if they are doing venous anastomosis, will do the proximal first, regardless of how they do it in a classical case. Here they will do the proximal first and then the distance. So you see the entire spectrum suddenly changes if you're doing a minimally invasive coronary bypass. If you're doing a minimally invasive coronary bypass on a pump patient, then yes, you need access to the groin where the patient might be cannulated percutaneous. Another issue which you need to look up, look into. Then there are novel situations and novel solutions and novel difficulties. You just want to do a redo for a two OM grafts. Patient is young. Patient has a functioning lima. Patient has two down OM grafts. The surgeon does not feel comfortable going through the sternotomy and trying to say he thinks that he was perhaps damaged the lima and put the patient at rest. This surgeon decides to do a left thoracotomy. Dissect the lung away, dissect the pericardium away, approach the OMs from the left thoracotomy and hang the proximals to the descending thoracic aorta. Voila. This is a novel difficulty and a novel solution. So again, if you've communicated, 
and you have anticipated, then you would be ready with all this. Next slide, please. It brings me to this question, proximal or distal first? Off pump, all off pump CABGs, I will do proximals first. All on pump clamped CABGs, I will do distal first. All CABGs in combination with valves, not only will I do distal first, but I'll leave the perfusing needle so that I can perhaps keep flushing the cardioplegia as I'm taking care of the valve. So there you go. One operation, three ways of doing it. What kind of suture is your surgeon wanting? What needle is your surgeon wanting? There are calcified vessels. So if you, if you anticipate that the that disease is diffused, then you have special needles which can penetrate through thick calcific valves. Walls, sorry, not valves, walls. You have needle lengths. Some of us like me, we use nine millimeters, but some such surgeons use 13 millimeters. So I have never used 8 for any of my anastomosis. There are surgeons who swear by 8 for distals and 6 for proximal. My protocol is 7 for distals and 6 for proximal. So all that stuff. The biggest problem I have with suture companies in this country is nobody gives me a 90 centimeter suture long enough so that I can parachute it down when I'm doing a coronary. But yes, so 65 centimeters, 70 centimeters, all those things, again, anticipation. Talk to your surgeon. Not every surgeon is the same. This is not a thali menu. This is a la carte menu. You will get surgeons with different preferences. Uh, the other day, two days ago, we wound up using a proximal device for a calcified aorta. So familiarize yourself with these. Uh, Guidant used to make them. Now I think there is an insured device which is made by two or three companies. So familiarize yourself with them. Be, they, these are expensive. 20, 25,000. Make sure that one of them is somewhere in the operating room. Suddenly the surgeon asks, calcified and I need a proximal device. So again, anticipation. Communication. You should have discussed this with the surgeon. You said, well, insure device. Hey, hey, rakhna hai, nahi rakhna hai, what to do with it? So all that. And lastly, but not least, the surgeon has sewn the vessel down. He's not happy. He wants to revise the vessel. The other horrifying thing is he's tied just one knot and the suture breaks. So make sure that the suture, when he's tying, one arm is appropriately long enough, the other arm is long. For purposes of uh, economy, I generally keep one needle on the double arm needle. My nurses generally tend to wet your hands with saline, a warm if you're doing off pump or slightly lower temperature if you're doing on pump with moderate hypothermia. This just ensures that your hand gloves on which dried blood may be there moves smoothly and you tie not smoothly. However, still if the suture breaks, then you and surgeon should be on the same page. If it breaks after four or five knots, the surgeon might ask you to take an additional suture on both sides and tie it up and forget about it. If it breaks after one or two knots, he might want to redo the entire anastomosis. So on the floor, have a nurse with an extra 7-0 in her hand, perhaps not open for the uh, economy and cost saving, but at the last minute, each surgeon should not be yelling 7 okay, 7 okay, and the nurse is running around uh, the operating room trying to get a 7. So anticipate that if you are going to do three graphs, keep four 7 -0s. The fourth one can always go back in the shelf later. Next slide, please. Uh, we used to, when I was training, we used to do a lot of redo CMEGs abroad. I have personally done redo CABGs here in this country, but our uh, proportion of redo CABGs is low. The patient is very scared. Ek ho gaya, bar, and then when you tell them the risk that he may die, to aur bhag jate. however, these days with uh, aspirin and statins and my cardiology colleagues getting more and more aggressive, even in the best, the redo CABG numbers are falling. But that doesn't mean that you will not get to see a redo CABG. All conventional redo rules, patches, access, groin access, oscillating saw, if the surgeon uses, all apply. But in a CABG, it's difficult. Where has the vein been harvested from? You'll be surprised. Scars are not visible on many legs. Some scars heal fantastically. So don't depend on the fact that my patient ka leg dek ke scar dek ke, I will find out where which leg was used earlier. Let it be documented. Let it be in your handshake so that the 
Nor Sukhan Skal Singh that he's had a previous CIBG, his brain has been harvested from the right leg, the left leg is free. What to do if he's third time around? I've done some two or three third time rounds. Short saffiness is a is a solution if you have nothing else. Positioning for a short saffiness is different. You have to abduct and externally rotate the knee joint so that you can work with the short saffiness. What to do with old grafts? What to do if the surgeon suddenly saws through a non-functioning graft? Don't worry, nothing will happen. What to do if the surgeon suddenly saws through a partly functioning graft? All hell will break loose. Patient will become ischemic. What to do if surgeon suddenly dinks a functioning memory on which about 40% of the heart depends? So again, here, be on the same plane. Be on communication here with the perfusionist, with the surgeon, that this is a case where we may need crash bypass, crash IABP, and then salvage the patient as it is. And what to do for partly functioning old grafts? Don't touch them. Don't tie them. If you go back and read, uh, I, I understand your nurses, but your surgeons must have read seminal articles from uh, Cleveland Clinic about redo. Old, partly or functioning old grafts should be left alone. They will die their natural death when you put a new graft. How to find where to anastomose? So look for the old anastomosis and start tracing the vessel from there. It's not easy. This is not virgin territory. You cannot find coronary arteries like you found in the first operation. And the surgeon might want some, you know, wash, something, a 15 blade to gently trace it. So be ready with all that. Next slide. What do you do if you have an unstable patient? Suddenly somebody calls from the cath lab, my patient has crashed. Are you prepared for intraaortic balloon pump? Are you prepared for emergency cardiopulmonary bypass? These are the emergencies which can happen pre-op or peri-op. What happens if suddenly the surgeon says that this graft I put, the vessel was bad, it's not working. Are you ready again? Have you talked to the surgeon? Is there a protocol in place that the surgeon will revise this graph? On the other hand, the surgeon may look at the monitor and say, ah, this is a small diagonal. There's no hemodynamic change. I think I will leave it. So be ready for both eventualities. The surgeon might decide to leave it. The surgeon might decide to revise it. These days when we do off-pump surgery and position our heart, be aware of the lie of the venous graph. Suddenly it can distort. I remember in the olden days, we used to, I mean, I was trained in the 90s when coronary bypass was not very common in India. We used to put dot with the skin marker all along the length of the way, just to avoid distortion business. So then that brings me to the next uh, difficulty which a surgeon may have. I'm going to revise this graph. So are you ready? Is he going to use the same condom? Is he going to patch on a small piece of vein, end-to-end -end anastomosis? You have an extra suture available? Has the patient decompensated in all this procedure? So are we now then going to give the patient support and then revise the graft? Or we are patient is hemodynamically stable and we are revising the graft? I've put an IMA and I think there is ST on my anterior leads. I think my IMA flow is not good enough. So what am I going to do? Most surgeons will put a vein distal to the eye. Again, you have to be ready. Don't Believe for a minute that nobody has seen this. All surgeons who do enough cases will see all these issues. And therefore, you have to be ready. Every time there is an IMA, be in the back of your mind should be a small niggling doubt. Is this IMA flow good? When you dis divide the IMA, when you see it flowing at mm -hmm. pressures, these all things should be looked upon to avoid this IMA adequacy problem. Next slide, please. We have, I think, taken care of the coronary part of it. We shall move to the mitral valve, aortic valve, tricuspid valve, and certain other situations. So mitral valve, is your diagnosis confirmed? What are you going to do? Is there transesophageal echocardiography in the room? Is only mitral valve surgery planned or a tricuspid in combination with mitral valve or it is a mitral and aortic or it is a mitral and aortic and tricuspid both. If you're going to use the mitral and aortic, then you need to know that the surgeon will do the mitral first and the aortic second. Never do it other way now. Next slide, please. So now a surgeon decides, no, I'm going to do a mitral valve. 
So this surgeon, does he use an artificial cord? Do you have five zero vortex? For some strange reason, I don't know why, even me, all surgeons seem to prefer a Gore-Tex legitimate stitch for fashioning grafts, for fashioning cording. Is he going to fashion the cords on the table? Is he going to use a particular device which is marked for measuring his cordal length? See, he's doing a mitral valve repair in a flaccid diastolic arrest. So it's going to be tricky in measuring the cords. Are you subscribing to a ready-made uh, cord, uh, bunch of cords which are supplied across the shelf? All this again to be ready. Do you have a marker pen? Because when he's going to put the saline, he's going to mark the places where the AML and PML approximate. And then they look like what is emoji mein kehta, and a smiling face. Hence the mitral smiley. So there you go. For a simple mitral valve repair, Goretic sutures, rings, ring sizers, markers, specialized measures for measuring cordal length, a marking pen, saline test, a septo syringe, and at the end of it, be ready to take out the ring and replace it with a valve if it doesn't work. Next slide, please. Is he going to replace? What do you do if you have a small left atrium? Believe me, if you have a small left atrium, the surgeon's life is going to be miserable. He's going to yell and scream all the time. As a rule, I cannulate the SVC with the right angle cannula high up so that I have a lot of room to work under. Is he going to dissect between the lower end of the left atrium and IVC and open it up? I wonder how many of you have seen what is the surgery done for atrial fibrillation called maze operation. If you've seen a maze operation and your surgeon has done a maze operation, he'll be never, never unhappy with a small left atrium. Remember, even if he's not unhappy with the small left atrium, when he closes the small left atrium, about 30% of his suture line is going to disappear from view. 20% of the inferior border and some. The upper border is going to go under the eye SVC and the lower border is going to go into the oblique sinus of the pericardium. So you have to be very sure because this, once you come off bypass, is going to be incredibly difficult to repair if he's bleeding from it. Now you've opened the LA, the LA was good size, and suddenly in elderly patients, you have massive annular calcification. So what is your surgeon going to do? Is he going to use rongeurs? Is he going to bear the entire annular calcification? Or he's going to take sutures away from the annulus, pledge big needles, and thread them through? Is he going to change that? If he suddenly manages to bear the annular calcification, suddenly he sees that, my God, I see that my left atrium and left ventricle have fallen apart. Now, this patient is a potential candidate for LV rupture, another complication you never want to have. Again, there has to be communication between you and your operating surgeon to tell ye kya ho guys. Is your surgeon going to preserve the cords as is the norm these days? Most surgeons will preserve the entire cords. If, are you going to use a bileaflet valve? Are you going to use a monoleaflet valve? The monoleaflet valve, TTK Chitra has Big problems, at least in my hands, when I have done a cordial preservation. Because the monoleaflet moves out of the ring, holding ring. On the other hand, the bileaflet valves seem to work very well. If the patient is an AF, is your surgeon routinely going to take care of the left atrial appendage? Is he going to put a coolie clamp from outside and then tie it with a strong silk? Or is he going to close it running from inside with what I do is a, a foro suture? Next slide, please. I forgot in the previous slide, what is he going to do with clots? Is he going to remove them? Is he going to flush the whole thing? After having taken the clots, is he going to excise the left atrial appendage? All these things are important. Many surgeons, if they are faced with a huge left atrial clot, will actually take the entire clot out, make sure that the clot has been completely removed before they touch the valve. For the fear that a small piece of clot also, once the valve is excised, goes and lodges in the left ventricle, voila, you have a stroke the next day morning in the ICU. So there are some special situations. Are you doing a redo mitral valve? Is this redo following CMV? Is this redo following open mitral surgery? Is this redo following a BMV? You might laugh at me. BMV is not surgery. 
But believe me, if you have had a BMV and the surgeon opens the left atrium and suddenly somebody retracts and the procedurist screams, airlock, 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 because the BMV has left behind a PFO. And the minute you open the left atrium, the right, air will go from the left side onto the right atrial side, which may or may not be you know, taken care of and the drainage will stop and all hell will break loose. So if it is post BMV, is the surgeon going to tape by cavity? Or he's just going to quickly take a stitch on the PFO, which normally I've never done, but I'll by cavity tape and snare down so that the air will not upset the perfusion. Additional lysis, how is he going to do additional lysis? In a closed mitral valvotomy, which you may or may not have seen, people used to use a pledgeted stitch on the LV apex, which was stuck to the pericardium and the lung. And remember that the dense adhesions happen where it has been opened inferior to the phrenic nerve on the left side, something which a surgeon generally cannot see before going on bypass. Other special situation is a minimally invasive approach. A lot of us, I also do minimally invasive mitrals, but when not to do, there is a patient who's got mitral stenosis and mild aortic regurgitation. You cannot get to the left ventricle from a right thoracotomy and a small one at that. This patient will fibrillate. His, his cardioplegia will not work. So for God's sake, stay away from these patients. Trying to do minimal. Yes, there are very experienced surgeons who will be able to do this. In a minimally invasive uh, mitral valve procedure, de-airing is of paramount importance. I flood the entire field with carbon dioxide. My theory being carbon dioxide is more soluble than oxygen and air in the blood and the carbon dioxide will get dissolved in the blood. Whatever bubbles are there will be primarily carbon dioxide bubbles, which will over the time get dissolved in blood and get flushed out as the patient gets ventilated most of There's a very long de-airing needle there for minimally invasive mitral valve or any minimally invasive ASD or mitral valve procedure. Next slide, please. We move on to the other valve. This is aortic valve. Are you going to do just an aortic valve? Are you going to do something to the aortic root? Does the patient have aortic stenosis? Does the patient have aortic regurgitation? Does the patient have both things? It is important to find out whether the patient has pure aortic stenosis or pure aortic regurgitation. How are you going to give your cardioplegia? Do the surgeons use retrograde cardioplegia? If there is no ejection and it's a tight aortic stenosis, the surgeon might opt to give root cardioplegia first and then give retrograde cardioplegia later on. But anticipate these needs. Anticipate the fact that if the surgeon is going to cannulate the individual coronary ostia, what is his preference for the cannulate? There are different kinds of cannulate, different angles for the left coronary, for the right coronary. There is a cup-like cannula, which I generally like. It does not violate the integrity of the coronary artery. It merely creates a vacuum kind of a thing over the coronary ostium and blood goes through. Having said all that, you've opened the aortic root. The surgeon has taken stitches, everything or, or exposed. Now you've got a very dense, tenotic, calcified aortic valve. What are you going to do? My protocol is to try and start excising the valve first a little bit and then shove in a wet two by two gauze into the left, left ventricle. Liberally use suction from the wall and then excise and use rongers. All rongers come in three ways, forward angled, straight and downward angled. Make sure that they are all available on the table. Make sure that in case there is a little bit of separation or bearing of the myocardium, you may have, I, whenever this happens in a calcific aortic valve, I will use plagiated stitches. Otherwise, I will not use plagiated stitches in an aortic valve. Always be aware of the fact that the left coronary ostium is the most dependent and a small bit of calcium can quickly slip into the left main coronary artery. And last but not the least for surgeons like me who put a gauze in the left ventricle to catch all entrapped calcified particles, make sure that the gauze is out before you start putting valve sutures. Next slide, please. What do you do if you have a small aortic root? Is your surgeon going to use a smaller size valve? Depending on the body surface area, many Indian patients are small. The surgeon may elect to use a 19 valve, particularly in small size ladies 
who we do not expect are going to go marathon running. But anything smaller than 19, I will augment the route. I will do it with native pericardium. How does your surgeon do it? It's a teardrop shaped stitch. Teardrop shaped pericardium which sits hooded like this and two stitches follow of my two stitches actually fall on the false annulus which is created by the pericardium. So communication and anticipation. Again, two major needs for a small aortic root. Is the surgeon going to combine a pental for a massive AR? Go x-ray me once the patient comes to the operating room, the x-ray is put up, the aortic root looks huge, humongous. Then maybe you think of pentals. Some surgeons will repair the aortic valve and only do a graft and coronary reimplantation called David's operation. I have never done them. I have seen them being done. I would rather do a classical pental. Now, if you're going to do a classical pental a day before, you have to be ready. Communication is there. List up. You must have seen the list. Bental. Is he going to use a pre-made conduit, which I normally do? Or is he going to tell you, okay, I'm going to size and now I want a graft and I want a valve and I'm going to stitch the valve on the uh, graft and make a conduit on the table. Again, if you've gone earlier a day before you know the list, you've talked to the surgeon, these difficulties will not happen on the table. Next slide, please. Most common tricuspid valve surgery is done in co combination with mitral valve surgery. Solitary tricuspid disease is very rare. I trained with Gordon Danielson at the Mayo Clinic, so I generally do a lot of Epstein replacements. But with this uh, pacemaker, AICD, chemo, pole, all these things becoming very common, tricuspid valve invasion is becoming very common and you may still run into a patient who needs only tricuspid valve replacement without his left-sided valves being taken care of. I guess cannulation and the fact that you have to take, you have to take to open the right atrium to look at the tricuspid valve. Now, if you are combining it with the mitral procedure, is the surgeon going to cut across the fossa valves and then do the mitral also from uh, uh, the right atrium. Some surgeons, my partners do that. I generally open the left atrium and right atrium and do the mitral through the left atrium and tricuspid through the right atrium. Uh, right atrium. What to do if you had a past mitral valve surgery in which there was a trivial TR which was neglected 15 years down the track. Now the patient is back to you with an RA huge and florid tricuspid regurgitation. I generally use minimally invasive approach here. My anesthesiologist will cannulate uh, the internal jugular going all the way down to SVC, I will cannulate groin for the aortic return and IVC return. Now, mind you, suddenly the rules of the game have changed. Even before I put a skin incision, my anesthesiologist has heparinized the patient completely. Even before I put the skin incision, the perfusionist is in the room and many times on pump. And yes, I will do these beating. I will not ask for cardioplegia. So there you go. Suddenly the entire valve protocols have changed. Next slide, please. Ah, this is a dreadful thing. Native valve endocarditis is common in aortic because of high pressures. What is more worrisome is prosthetic valve endocarditis. You have a patient, I did a wonderful mitral valve on. He goes home. A year later he comes back with fever and there is a vegetation sitting on the mitral. What do you do? Now, this has got a lot of complications. Patient is perhaps septic. Patient has problems with bleeding tendency. Patient will require blood products. Check with the perfusionist. This is a redo surgery. The adhesions may be bad because of an ongoing infective pathology. And after all this, what do you do? Where do you put your aortotomy and atriotomy? I generally tend to reopen the same atriotomies and the same aortotomies. In aortotomies, sometimes, sometimes I will open them slightly higher, but generally open my old atriotomies and old aortotomies. In old aortotomies, the aorta may be fragile and you may need pericardial or felt reinforcement along your entire aortic suture line. When you start excising this infected prosthetic valve, if you use the mitral valve, then it, it really helps to go through the old operative nodes. 12 sutures, 
you must look at 12 pledges somewhere embedded in the valve or uh, free floating somewhere in the left atrium. If an infective uh, endocarditis has caused paravalvular leak, then half the valve might be lying popped in the left atrium. These patients are more sick than your regular endocarditis patients. If the regular endocarditis patients are sick, and then on top of it, if it has caused paravalvular leak, they are even more sick. Uh, for people who are fluent in Hindi would love this uh, euphemism. Pele mia bavre pame khai bang. First you are mad and then you ingest cannabis on top of it. So uh, what size of prosthetic valves do you put? Once completely excised, my protocol is to put the same size or a size larger, one size larger, one size larger. And the worst thing you want is a double valve which is infected and then has chewed off or chewed up or eaten up the aerodomitral continuity. Use pericardial patches. I have done only two such cases, lost one of them, and pray to God that I never get to see them. Because in case you are familiar with these concepts, A1, A2, P1, P2, from P1, A1 to A2, the entire area is bare and you can actually look into the aorta from there. You have to reconstruct the fibrous trigone there, which is very commonly done with the pericardium. And it's, it's bad. So again, if you're communicating with the surgeon, you're anticipating, maybe you use native pericardium, which might be difficult in a redo. May you, maybe you want a bovine pericardium. Maybe your stitches strategy may change. Next slide, please. So redo surgery is, uh, again, usual redo consideration. We went through this yesterday. It doesn't really take much time repeating this ad hoc, ad nauseum. But what happens if your previous surgeon put a bioprosthetic valve? You put a bioprosthetic valve for a mitral situation and mitral regurgitation. The patient behaves very well. The LV suddenly becomes smaller. The struts of the mitral valve may be impinged in the left ventricular muscle. Oh my God, what have we got here? So be aware of that situation. Uh, there used to be, and there still are some units which do a lot of homographs or do some ROS procedures. A ROS means putting in a pulmonary valve in the aortic position and putting in a bioprosthetic in the uh, pulmonary position. The most famous patient of ROS who has had three surgeries. First ROS, then revision of his uh, aortic valve, and then revision of his pulmonary valve is recently is Arnold Schwarzenegger. But if you put in a homograph, the homographs calcify. Huh? Anybody who says my homographs don't calcify 12 years, 15 years down the track, the advantage is that this patient in the aortic position with a homograph has not taken oral anticoagulants. But the homograph is calcified. So it's going to be a mess to take out. It's going to be a me mess to reconstruct the aorta sometimes. Two root widenings I have done. I have done for homograph situations. You have to be extra careful because the coronary ostia may be frozen. Again, communicate and be ready. Be prepared with bovine pericardium on the table or native harvested pericardium on the table. Next slide, please. Are you combining valvular surgery with atrial fibrillation surgery? I don't know if many people do it. I have done maze operations. They're just too painful. And so I don't do that. Are you combining with it with HOCM? In which case, if some surgeons with HOCM will replace the mitral valve. So now you're opening the aorta, do an aortotomy and then excise the septum and you're opening the left atrium and then doing a mitral valve replacement. Are you doing a valve and coronary combination? If you're doing a valve and coronary combination, distal grafts are done first and cardioplegia is perfused through that. Again, make sure that if you're doing a valve and coronary combination in a mitral situation, your OM grafts are going to be gone. And traditionally, everybody will teach you that after a rigid mitral valve in the mitral annulus, you do not lift the ventilator to see the bleeding. So you have to be sure that your OM grafts are leak proof. How are you going to handle the aortotomy? Where are you going to cite your venous grafts if you're going to put it on the air? Are you going to do your entire thing on a clamp or are you going to uh, you know do the aortic valve replacement close the aortotomy and release the clamp and then put a partial clamp beware that the partial clamp if put on very high pressures may distort your old aortotomy 
in the olden days when very high profile bioprosthetic valves were used, one of the stents could be entrapped. These days it doesn't happen. Technology has made sure that these days it doesn't happen. But what to do is suppose you did a coronary bypass. I did a coronary bypass on a 60 year, 65 year old man. I put in a lima and two veins. And he did very well. Now he's 75. Now he's got aortic stenosis. Lima is functioning, but two veins are down. Now I have to replace his aortic valve and put in proximal grafts in a redo situation. So even worse is that one graft is functioning, one graft is down. I only have to revise one graft. So the entire aortotomy may not be a conventional aortotomy. There may not be space for making conventional aortotomies because the grafts are sitting there. So in a redo situation again, how are we going to do the aortotomy is very important. How are we going to cite it is also very important. Next slide, please. I think uh, I most probably have covered most of the stuff. I am sure that not all can be covered. There was a lot of talk between me and the Merrill people. Uh, I have done one physical program in their academy. Their academy is beautiful. Very good. Uh, perhaps my take home message from the physical program was that most nurses did not ask me questions during presentations, but when they met me socially over many times, they asked me a lot of relevant questions. So the medal people then have fashioned breakout rooms. And uh, I would expect Dhani to guide me to which breakout room to go to. I am, as usual, again, very open to questions and I am very open to communicating in Hindi. Uh, okay, so the chat, group chat doesn't show any questions. So that's that. Uh, okay. Sonal, we could uh, stop the YouTube live now because uh, I think the breakout rooms will not look very uh, well on that. We will just 